I'll take the risk of um, starting with my own story, because I have a story about Jesus all, and I have a story about theology, and I have a story about life, and uh, maybe it can help somebody, I don't know. I think the worst, the worst time of my life was when I was about two years into my studies in theology. And um, that's probably the closest I've been to a depression in my life. Actually, I remember coming home from Newbold um, and, uh, at, for Christmas vacation, and my father was saying to me, Bjorn, what is happening to you? And I hadn't said anything about theology or what was happening in my mind or in my heart, but he just saw that. And um, it was like this. Um, I thought I had everything figured out. And I remember when I was newly baptized, 16 years old, standing on the streets of Norway, Oslo, handing out newspapers that we were sharing with people and thinking I knew everything and I knew all the answers. And uh, we could just tell people about uh, our Adventist message. And um, then, going into studying theology, coming upon me a wave, not only a wave, but a, a hurricane of questions. And this was not something that Newball College presented to me. This was something that happened in a dormitory. This was something that happened between us as, as uh, at that time, photocopies were just spread around and they were circulating and we were reading things that we had never heard and we were reading stuff that was challenging the very essence of what we were really believing. And uh, this was a really rough time. And I think it is a time that so many young people go through today. We often are very conscious of a change in our lives that happens when we are about 15, 14, and that sort of thing. And, we, and, and as, we, as our mind matures to be able to think in abstract terms, we, uh, we know that at that point in our life there is some serious thinking that has to go on and we have to redefine what, what our faith is all about. And this, many of us who sit here today, we can say that it was really at that time when I was 14, 15, 16, that was when I made a decision. But something, something that we often don't talk about, and I think is happening with our young people today, as it did before, is that when you move into your 20s, there are some new issues coming up in your life that you're not prepared for. Because your childhood faith has to grow into a mature faith. And the, 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 the sort of the ideas that you carry with you from childhood into adulthood, the, they do not fit anymore to reality. Your childish perceptions of reality and even theology and your thinking about God and life cannot go with you from childhood into adulthood without some questions. And, and it all hit me in, in one go as I was there at Newball College. And for me, theology was like this. And this is what, what I was, what had been made in my mind from my own thinking and from what I had learned. We had a, I had a series of things I believed in, and it, there was no difference whether this was a central thing in Christianity or a peripheral thing. Everything that was true was true. And whether it was small or big, it was one part of that building of truth that was my idea of it. It was like building a house of cards. You know how you put two cards like this? And there, and there, and there, and you have a layer of cards on top of that. And then you build another set of cards like this. And um, it's very fragile. Don't blow. Don't touch anything. You're just, just standing there. And if your idea of truth, and if your idea about theology, how you interpret things, and how you hold them all together, if they are like that, 
What will happen if you remove one card? Everything just falls down. And as, th- as, that, as issues were um, raised and things I believed in and others believed in were questioned, suddenly this whole house of, of, an, of an understanding of reality came tumbling down. This was a time in the history of the Adventist church that really many pastors left the church and even um, others, of course. This was the time, many of you don't really know about it, maybe don't care about it, but this was the time of Desmond Ford, sanctuary discussion. This was the time of uh, Walter Ray, the white lie, issues about Ellen White, her copying from other sources. This was the time that we had just finished about the discussion about righteousness by faith and grace and that sort of thing. And it was all up in the air. It was just chaos. And for us who, who had never learned to deal with these things, this was, it was also chaos in our minds. So I, I just had to, to see this happening to me. And have you heard a song by R.E.M.? Losing my religion? Yeah, it's not really about uh, religion. It's when you, I heard an interview with them and I say it's about a girl. But for, for, for lots of people, it is really losing my, how significant that is in your life when that which you put your trust in is, is coming down. That is your very existence. That's your very platform you're standing on. And to, to go into a future of being a minister and experience that your faith is sort of going like this and you don't know where you are about anything. It's quite hard. Some people also at Newball College helped me. I'm so glad I stayed on for a long time because some people did their quite short study, went home, and they had so many things crashed in their thinking. I don't, I'm not going to go into the details about that. I just know, I, I just want to say something about building up a faith again because I had to do it. And uh, there was a point in time where I had to ask myself, what do I really believe in? What do I really believe in? When it comes to, you know, Christ and Bible and that sort of thing. Well, I could say, I believe that Christ, that Jesus has lived. Okay? And then I actually also said, And maybe that was a little bit a leap of faith. But I said, I believe that he rose from the dead. Because I think there is some testimonies to that that is quite strong. Then I said to myself, I I do not believe that this world came from an accident. I believe that God created the world. Maybe I didn't ask myself how. I just said, I believe God created the world. I believe there is a God And actually, if you say those three things, there are really many things you can build on top of it. It's incredible how much you can build on top of it. Um, And um, somehow, this building, I had had that platform. I said, you know, how Christ, the resurrection, how creation. And I could start to build things up on that about um, other aspects of our faith. I don't, I'm not going into there. I just know that my faith and my understanding is no longer a card house. It is something that is built on some fundamental things that I'm really safe about. And those things stay there. And there are constructions in, our, in my mind on top of these pillars. But now it is like this. If somebody takes something out and away, it doesn't crumble because the pillars are there and there is something solid about that. That is a very different way of approaching the Adventist message. Why I'm telling this? 
because I think there's a lot of people, maybe sitting here today, there's a lot of young people around us who have that perception of truth, that every part must be true, or if one thing is false, that everything goes. But this is also, I think, what this conference is about. It is about saying what is central and what is peripheral. What is the, the very basis that we need to take care of and build on. So, that is my story. That's why, for me, to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is Christ. And that is my starting point as I try to interpret the rest of Adventism. Even as I read the Bible, there was this question, is there an apex? For me, there's absolutely an apex. And also Hebrews 1 says that. That there's so many ways God has spoken in the past, but now He has spoken to us through His Son. And He is the very projection of God's being showing us who He is. Well, that's why I'm really happy about this and excited about this, uh, this conference. That's really not my topic, I, other than this... Uh, <laughs> Other than the fact that it's related to this. Uh, my, my, my text, my, my verse, my part of these verses is this. After all the glorious uh, description of he who is before everything and above everything and larger than everything and that all things refer to him, after that it comes this, this sentence. And he is the head of the body and that is the church. He is the head of the body, and that is the church. We'll wait a little bit with that text. Thank you. Um, you know, when I start, I think this is going to be an, an easy presentation because, uh, because uh, you know, it's a good illustration about the head and the body. You know, you have, you have uh, the brain up here, and then you have all the nerve cells going down through your spine, and it goes out to the whole body, and how Christ is that. Then I started to, to read and think about this, and and suddenly I discovered that, um, or was reminded, that in biblical time, the head was not where your thinking was. The heart is where thinking is. Right? The heart is where you feel. The heart is where you think. Like what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no heart what has not come into any heart, actually a new translation would say, into anybody's mind. No mind has conceived, but the original is the heart. It has not entered the heart, what God has prepared for, for his people. The thinking is in the heart. What does it say about God when he knows our thoughts? He knows what is in our hearts. Okay. So, so my whole illustration went out of the window. And, um, and uh, Jesus is not... That, that Jesus is the head of the church is not that he is our brain. It means something else. What is it? What is it? It means exactly what we have been reading so far in this text. That he is first. That he is the top. That he has supremacy that he is the firstborn, that he is the leader, he is the head of the tribe, he is the head of state, he is the head of department, he is the cornerstone, which is the, in, the, in the Greek is the headstone. That's the way Christ is the head. He is the very first, the top. Do you know um, about, about cornerstone? About cornerstones? We, uh, we don't build houses from cornerstones anymore. But a cornerstone was um, a large stone, very carefully made and very carefully placed where a huge building should stand. Because everything in constructing the building would be done in reference to where that stone was. That's the headstone, because it's the headstone that defines the whole building. And Christ is the head. But what does that mean? I already... Just five minutes left. For, um, 
What does it mean? I'd like to say one thing for us personally, and I'd like to say one thing for the church as a community. There's lots of things that could be said, and if I can have that one text. We can see it on the screen together. Um, this is a rather long text. This is the context in Ephesians where, um, where it talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I was thinking about those five apostles, prophets, evangelists. Don't see many of those around. But pastors and teachers, we have quite a few. Maybe something to pray for. Um, the, I just put one part of it in bold text. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. He is not our brain. He is the goal and the, the first of the church. He is where we are growing to be. He is, he is the aim of what we are all about. So what I want to say about us personally, I like to say something about obedience. And I know, you know, if I say that, there are some Adventists that are just going to be have the shivers. Because there are some of us who have grown up in the church. We have such a and a reaction towards Phariseeism that we cannot handle that anybody says anything about obedience anymore. Right? We just have to talk about His grace, and we have to talk about His goodness, and His acceptance. And this is wonderful, and that's the gospel. Fine. But there is an element of obedience there. Do you get the shivers when, you talk, when somebody mentions obedience? Do you feel like, oh, no, 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 not that. I can't handle that. And somebody's demanding something of me. Maybe you haven't understood the gospel then. I don't know. But this, this message that about Christ being the head of the body is that he is our goal. That is the direction of our lives. Jesus talks about um, somebody building a tower. And he says, if you want to build a tower, you should um, think about before you start if you really have the resources to build all the way up. Because if you only build half of it or two-thirds of it and you don't have the money to build the rest, people are going to laugh at you. What did he say that? I think he said this, you know, before you say you're going to follow me, think about what it means. Think about what it means. Are you ready for that? Do you really want that? And it's not so, done in sort of a very negative way that, you know, pull yourself together. No, it's, is this really what you believe in? And if it is, there is something beautiful in obedience. There is something great about walking in his path. Okay. The other text from Colossians, a little bit later in the book, in the second chapter, talking about people who are really setting up man made rules. And he says about this person in the middle of the text here he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and, and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. A shorter version. This person has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body grows as God causes it to grow. It's interesting that it says, from Christ the whole body grows, not only towards him, but it, it is from his energy, as if it were, that the body grows up to him. And it grows as God causes it to grow. Let me say something about community and about 
I probably shouldn't go there. The time is gone, but I have to. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been thinking so much about this because the church has asked me to be a president, union president, for, for 11 years. And I have been in that role. And I've asked myself again and again and again, what does it mean to be a leader in the Christian church and in the Adventist church when Jesus is the head of the church? What does it mean to be the union president when Christ is the head of the church? What is my role? What should I do? What should I not do? It is not my church. Of course it isn't. It's his church. This is, a, this is a big one. I could spend an hour on this one. But I would like to say a couple of small things. A couple of small things. Christian leadership is about understanding what Christ is doing among his people and trying to, supply, to, trying to play into that. We are cooperating with, with what God is doing. We are not leading the church. We are leading the church in light of something, in light of the fact that Christ by His Holy Spirit is leading the church. The church, second, the church is not a corporation. The church is a living organism where the Spirit of Christ can act through people. And if the Spirit of God doesn't only act through leaders, it acts through the church. The body of Christ is the body. What does that mean? You know, sometimes we think if Christ is the head, the leaders are the neck, right? And we can turn the head like we want. And all the information that we, with our knowledge, you know, about the head, what it is, the, all the information goes through here and down into the body. I don't believe that anymore. I, mean, I, I don't know if you ever believed it. But Christian leadership is about bowing to the fact that Christ is perfectly in his right to do whatever he wants to do in his church. And then it's loosening up and it's sort of scary. Where are we? Who's doing what? Why? How can we control that? Where, where do they go now? Where is, what's going to happen if they do that? And it's all like this. But still, it's not our church. It is the church of Christ. And He is the head of the church. Yeah. I'm sorry, friends. My time is up. But um, remember that at least. What happened in, in perspective of this conference? What happened to Paul when he went to Damascus? This is my conclusion. What happened to Paul when he went to Damascus? And he saw this light coming from heaven. And uh, he cried out, Who are you, Lord? What was the answer? I am Jesus what happened to his theology and his understanding of life and his understanding of God's people and anything that has to do with religion at that point? He just had to do this enormous reshuffle of his whole theology. Everything had to move around like this because there was a new piece of information that just went right into that picture and changed everything. This is what this, is, this conference is all about. To see what we do, what we think, our values, our ethics, our thinking in light of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you are the head of the church. You are our leader. You are my leader. Every part of your body is yours. We are yours. Lead us. Lead us into that which glorifies your name and make you even more the first, the top, the supreme. You are 
but we want to glorify your name. Be our head in your name. Amen.